Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Davis. I'm the social media manager here at RSDSA. I'm joined by Jim Broach, Executive Vice President and Director of RSDSA, and tonight's guest, Dr. Vivian Tofik. Dr. Tofik is a board certified anesthesiologist and pain medicine physician who specializes in the treatment of complex chronic pain disorders, including chronic post-operative pain, complex regional pain syndrome, and peripheral nerve injury. After completing her undergraduate degree in McGill University in Montreal, she obtained her MD and PhD in neuroscience with a focus on basic pain mechanisms at Dartmouth, Dartmouth Medical School in Hanover, New Hampshire. She then moved to California to join the Stanford Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine as an anesthesiology resident in the Fellowship in Anesthesia Research and Medicine program of which she now serves as a director. After completion of her subspecialty fellowship training in pain medicine, Dr. Tofik joined the faculty at Stanford and continues to research the immune contribution to persistent pain using clinically informed basic science while also caring for patients suffering from chronic pain. Her lab uses a variety of approaches from single cell sequencing to complex behavioral paradigms in mouse pain models to investigate the contribution of spinal cord glial cells microglial and astrocytes to the transition from acute to chronic pain. All amazing things. As always, remember that while the information shared here tonight is helpful, please consult your physician for personalized medical advice. All right, y'all. So before we pass it over to Dr. Tofik, Jim, do you have any announcements? We have so much going on, so I know you do. <laughs> first, first, I want to say last, last time we talked about our diagnostic card. So I'm going to just show you our, our tumbler mug, and uh, we're selling it in our store, and we have a surplus, so please buy it. But really, I wanted to just welcome everyone, and we're real excited about our presenter tonight. She's, she's brilliant, and we're really excited about her. But two things. This is our 38th year of service to our, our community, and we'd love for you to participate. And Alexis will put up a, a link to donate, even a dollar. Just It's a nice way to thank us. Uh, secondly, I would really love to encourage that we're doing a third annual walk, and uh, please join us. If you keep, don't have, don't join a team, you can buy a T-shirt and roll, walk, whatever, and that's going to happen on June 11th, and it's really exciting. And we really want to smash our goal. But again, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Definitely. So I'm going to add the links to the events that Jim just mentioned to the chat. And I'm also going to add a link to tonight's slides. You can follow along if you need to see them um, a little larger. But I think that's it. So Dr. Toffet, we're going to pass it over to you. Great. Thank you, Alexis and Jim. And thank you all for being here um, with me. Um, it's really an honor to, to speak with this group. I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. So um, you are the, the people, the patients um, who uh, my lab is working to uh, improve your care. So it's really good to be able to share with you a little bit about what we're thinking about and what we're working on with respect to CRPS. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a sort of basic introduction um, in terms of my thinking about pain and CRPS in particular. Uh, I will just note that I am going to discuss the off-label use of drugs. Um, and as Alexis already said, um, this is not medical advice. Um, please do speak with your physician directly about any of the recommendations that I make here. So as you all know, pain is a major clinical problem affecting 100 million Americans at a huge cost um, to society. Um, what really struck me when I started to practice pain management was that we really didn't have a great idea of what caused different types of pain. So the mechanisms or the cause of different types of pain um, was sort of still and is still a bit of a black box. And so patients coming in with things as different as chronic post-surgical pain or maybe even fibromyalgia maybe get, would get the same treatment. And as a scientist, this bothered me because I wanted things to be more clear. I wanted to understand the mechanism and then provide a clear treatment. So what is pain exactly? And I'm sure we, many of you are thinking about this all the time, but when we think about it from a research standpoint, we think of two words, so nociception, which is the neural process of encoding noxious stimuli, essentially saying there's nerves or neurons that transmit information um, from maybe your fingertip through to your spinal cord up to your brain. But then there's pain and pain is really defined differently. 
It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual potential tissue damage. And because pain is defined as an experience, it's inherently hard to treat. And it's also very hard to um, put a number on it. And you can see here on the side is this sort of classic pain scale. We, we ask patients, you know, rate your pain zero to 10. And it's like, well, it doesn't really feel like a complete um, assessment of what some individual is experiencing. Um, you know, it could be a five at that moment, but maybe most days it's an 11 out of 10. Maybe some days it's zero, maybe it's never zero. So there's a lot more that we need to understand about the experience of pain that we don't necessarily get at when we ask um, such a simple question as a scale of one to 10. But importantly for our discussion tonight and really for um, CRPS is the concept of acute pain. And really when is acute pain no longer acute pain? Because we know that acute pain is important um, for protection. If we touch something hot, we need to know that it's hot so that we can withdraw our hand and not end up with tissue damage. But at some point that acute pain can become chronic and we don't need that. We don't need chronic pain. There's no physiologic need for chronic pain. So how do we know when acute pain is no longer acute pain? I usually think about it in terms of trajectory. Um, patients should be improving, not worsening in the weeks after an injury, a surgery, or a trauma. And so if you fracture your hip, let's say, for example, you know, maybe it gets a little bit worse. You have a surgery, it gets a little bit better. Slowly things should be improving, but there's an expected trajectory of healing after a given injury um, that if you're falling off of that path, then that's a cause for concern. So as many of you are aware, um, not all chronic post-injury pain is the same. Many people have um, injuries and they resolve, and then some people have injuries and they end up with chronic pain. Um, and this is an example of a patient of mine um, who is a 28 year old, um, twisted her ankle and ended up with persistent pain, swelling, redness and warmth. And of course this group um, can already, you know, expect what the diagnosis is, but the diagnosis to many, unfortunately to many physicians is not clear. Um, and so really we have to sort of think about is when is chronic post-injury or chronic post-surgical pain actually equal to CRPS? Um, and again, it's a really important question because if we know if a patient has CRPS, we might adapt the treatment to the mechanism, meaning now it's a CRPS diagnosis, we're gonna do something different than just sort of the standard of care for pain, the general four letter word of pain. So CRPS diagnosis, um, you know, is, is mainly made off of these Budapest criteria, um, which many of you are familiar with. Um, so there's the four categories, sensory, pseudomotor, vasomotor, and motor. Um, in my experience of seeing patients with CRPS, um, of course, many have pain. This pain is very severe, um, but unlike other forms of chronic pain, um, patients with CRPS will often complain of touch sensitivity. So, you know, they'll change the clothes they wear, maybe only wearing short sleeve tops because having cloth on their arm, um, their CRPS limb is quite painful, or they'll wear different types of shoes because, um, you know, a closed toe shoe might be more uncomfortable for them to wear. And that type of touch sensitivity, um, I don't see as often in other pain conditions, let's say, for example, um, low back pain. Then there's also changes um, such as sweating, swelling, nail and hair growth changes uh, that can occur on the CRPS limb and often different from one side to the other, as well as changes in color and temperature. Um, the most specific um, diagnostic criteria are actually the motor symptoms. So tremor, weakness, and loss of range of motion can also be seen in CRPS and are um, very specific for the diagnosis of CRPS. I think one thing I should mention now that's really important, I think, and I've been seeing patients with CRPS now for about eight years, and I almost only see patients with CRPS, and then I have a research lab where we study CRPS, so I think about CRPS a lot. And I, what I keep telling people is the more I know about CRPS, the less I know about CRPS, because every patient who comes to see me in clinic meets these criteria in a unique and different way. So I have some patients who primarily have touch sensitivity. I have some patients who mainly are red hot and swollen, um, but not everybody meets all the criteria and the way they meet the criteria is different. And so again, this is where that sort of difference between presentations and what I would call heterogeneity um, is really important and also really important when discussing a treatment plan, because that also means that maybe there are different mechanisms leading to different subtypes of CRPS. And if there are different mechanisms leading to different subtypes, then maybe those different um, subtypes need different types of treatment. 
So, you know, with all that said, we have this very simple distinction in CRPS of type one being um, CRPS without a major or known nerve injury and type two being one with a known nerve injury. But as I'll tell you, many of us now think that most CRPS patients do have a nerve injury. It's just that we don't necessarily have the means to detect that nerve injury. Um, you know, we're not gonna see it based on an EMG. Maybe many of you have gone through EMGs where you do the needle study and it comes back totally normal. And then the answer is, oh, your nerves are fine. But actually those EMG studies don't necessarily give us the full picture of what's happening to the individual nerves. So I came up with this, what I call sort of a disease spectrum for peripheral pain. Um, it's not an exact match, but it helps me sort of think about patients who present with pain in the limb, let's say in a hand or foot, um, and just kind of thinking about what type of presentation they have. And so I think about neuropathic pain is, and this is all simplified, but just thinking neuropathic pain is really a pain in the distribution of a peripheral nerve. So somebody comes in with pain right here or pain, let's say here, more commonly, you know, from a carpal tunnel syndrome and the median nerve, that's the nerve that runs through the carpal tunnel supplies this part of the hand. So a patient might come and say, I have numbness right here. And then I would say, okay, that's classic neuropathic pain from a median nerve injury or median nerve compression of the carpal tunnel. But then you have a patient who comes with the same complaint, but now they have these additional features of CRPS. So they have a red, hot, swollen hand, but also this sort of distribution of numbness and tingling. Then you have patients who may present with a red, hot, swollen hand, but nothing more what we call dermatomal, nothing specific to one nerve distribution. And so that would be considered more of a CRPS type one. And then there's this other condition which seems to be completely different, but somehow also interacting with CRPS, which is called erythromyalgia. And patients with erythromyalgia classically present with burning pain relieved by cooling. So red hot hand that they put in ice a lot because the ice helped re relieve that burning. This is quite different from, again, and I, I don't wanna generalize because I know each patient with CRPS comes with different symptoms and different triggers. Um, but most of my patients with CRPS don't like to be cold. They actually like to be warm. And so this is a big differentiator between this sort of CRPS presentation and more of what I see with patients with erythromyalgia who are literally constantly trying to find ways to cool their painful limbs as opposed to warming their painful limbs. So CRPS can also be defined as having two phases. And we think of it as kind of having this like acute peripheral phase. So maybe, you know, you fall on your wrist, you fracture your, your wrist, your hand gets red hot and swollen, but then over time, um, you know, it kind of cools down and becomes more like the skin may be thickened, the muscles may be kind of more atrophic or, or thinned out. Um, and that sort of transition from the sort of like red hot acute phase to a cool and chronic phase can occur um, in about a year. And again, this is where generalization is hard. I have some patients who, you know, maybe were red hot just for a day and then they became cool and, and, and shrunken in, their, in that particular hand or foot. I have some patients who remained red hot and swollen for years after their injury. So it doesn't necessarily always shift from one to the other, but it's just sort of a paradigm that helps me at least mechanistically think of this, especially when we do some of our basic science research. The other thing is that um, early on, um, patients are more responsive to treatment. And this is where I try to spend a lot of time educating, especially my surgical colleagues, because if patients come in at this early phase, they definitely can do better with treatment compared to if patients present years after the initial injury. Um, so it's really important to try to catch people early on. So of course, many of, of us, many of you have probably had injuries in the past that did not result in CRPS, but injuries that may have resulted in significant inflammation. And so we think of inflammation as a normal response to injury. So you twist your ankle, it gets red hot and swollen. You know, you break a wrist, it gets red hot and swollen. That is expected and that's normal. And we need that response because the immune system comes in and helps sort of clean up the injury. It allows bone healing to occur. It allows nerves to regenerate um, and all of that. And it allows tissue to heal. So we need that inflammation, but we also need that inflammation to end. And again, this is where I come back to this trajectory slide, which is basically saying that, you know, people should be getting better, not worse in the weeks, 
or months after an injury or a surgery or a trauma. So who gets CRPS? Um, it's still considered to be quite rare, only about five to 25 cases per 100,000 per year, only about 50,000 new cases per year in, in the US. Of course, because it's my area of specific interest, I feel like it's much more common than that. I see many, many cases of CRPS, um, but obviously my perspective is quite skewed. But I also think that it's probably underdiagnosed and underrecognized, partly because it looks like normal inflammation. So at first, many people might not recognize that there's something off track with that particular injury. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky, is at what point do you call it CRPS? Or at what point do you say, oh no, this is just normal, you broke your wrist and it's supposed to be swollen. So there are some known risk factors for the development of CRPS. They include female gender, three to one for um, male, uh, female to male. Like many other pain conditions, women are just more susceptible, um, which we don't fully understand. Certainly a history of trauma or surgery, which makes sense based on um, you know, the mechanism I've talked to about already is that often after an injury um, or a surgery, often mild, CRPS can develop. There are some genetic um, causes of CRPS, although they're not very well understood. And this is an area of a lot of um, work being done in multiple labs around, around the world, really, especially in Europe. Um, and then cast tightness after injury. And this is a really interesting and important point um, because many patients will have the story of having been casted um, after an injury. And they'll say the cast felt too tight. And I went to the emergency department and I told them the cast felt too tight and they said, oh, it's fine. And then they go back and they have the same, you know, and the story goes on. And I've heard this story so many times now. And so again, and trying to educate, you know, the other healthcare providers who are seeing these patients, you know, try to say if a patient comes in and says the cast is too tight, you have to take it for what it is. And to cut the cast off, recast them if they still need to be immobilized. You know, if they can't move the arm yet because the fracture needs to heal, then that's fine. But you have to definitely take that complaint seriously. And so, interestingly, this has been looked at, and there's been research looking at cast tightness. And so, I sort of pose the question: What is up with cast tightness? Um, and so, actually, there was a study done 20 years ago now looking at the effect of vitamin C on the development of, of RSD and for you know, the former name of, of CRPS type one um, in wrist fractures. And what they found unexpectedly was for those who actually went on to develop RSD, 67% of those patients had what they called complaints in plaster, meaning that they complained that their cast was too tight. This was a European study, so plaster meaning the cast. Um, and so that was sort of intriguing. They were looking at something totally different. They were looking at the effect of vitamin C therapy, but they found this, this um, concern from patients. And then they went on to do a second study about 10 years later, where they looked at now, again, the effect of vitamin C, but they took this cast related complaints and they found that patients who had this cast related complaint had an almost six time higher risk of developing CRPS compared to patients who did not have a complaint of cast tightness. Um, so it is something, again, to be taken seriously. Now, of course, people always ask me, well, did the cast, the tight cast cause the CRPS? And the answer is, I don't know. This is where, you know, it's really unclear. I don't know if the person placing the cast always puts the cast on exactly the same way. And the person they casted that time swelled more than expected, in which case the cast then felt too tight, or that person casting actually placed the cast too tight. Um, it, you know, it, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that. All we know is that that sensation of the cast being too tight definitely does um, result in a higher risk of developing CRPS. Um, so we also see that there is um, often this transition from this acute peripheral to this chronic central phase of CRPS. And this is something that we're very interested in my lab. And there are many, many potential mechanisms that can underlie this. So this is a slide that's really like very um, anatomical, but I'll sort of walk everybody through this and I can talk more about it later if there are questions. Um, but it's really just trying to get across some of the potential mechanisms that underlie CRPS, not that just my group are working on, but that people you know, doing research on this around the world are looking at. But if we start here um, at the hand, so example, for example, this is just you know, like the example of a, of a hand injury, but it could be a foot. Um, so there's some sort of injury that occurs. And then there are these nerve cells or neurons 
that start here at the hand and they go all the way back here to the spinal cord. So really coming from the hand up to the spinal cord here. And in that area of the spinal cord here, this nerve, this nerve cell meets other cells, including another nerve cell that will then go up to the brain. And then in the cortex or the top part of the brain here is where we have the awareness. So this all happens very fast, as you can imagine, because if you touch something hot, you're going to immediately be aware of it, pull your hand back, that kind of thing. Um, but there's other things that can happen at this level. And part of what can happen here is that this nerve cell and this nerve cell, also shown here, are also influenced by these immune cells called glia. And there's here an example of a microglial cell and an astrocyte. These are two glial cells that were very interested in my lab. And what we're studying in the lab is trying to see how these cells can actually be pro-pain and they can actually cause pain when they start to release pain-inducing pain substances or inf inflammation essentially in the spinal cord. And if they get all inflamed, then they can send signals to these nerve fibers that then enhance how they talk to each other. And so this is an area of, of intense study in my lab, as well as the other inflammation type cells that are out here in the hand itself. So in the hand itself, you have the site of the injury, you have the nerve fibers here, and then you have all of these inflammatory cells that are in initially trying to help with the pain. Um, but again, like I said, for some reason, and some patients don't seem to resolve. There's also a lot being studied on B cells, which are these sort of um, important cells for long lasting immunity. And we think may be involved in autoimmunity autoimmunity, which is essentially like the body attacking itself. And so what the body does is it, it thinks that if there's a sort of attacking foreign virus or bacteria, and it mounts an immune response to that, even though there is no attacking foreign substance or bacteria, and that in part can contribute to CRPS. So there's definitely these autoimmune or autoinflammatory mechanisms. And then the sort of classic CRPS mechanisms that we think of originally because it was called reflex sympathetic dystrophy or RSD. The sympathetic comes from this concept that the sympathetic nervous system um, is also involved in how we sense and how we um, and how our, our hand you know, gets its blood circulation, how it turns red, how it can become swollen. A lot of these features come from the sympathetic nervous system, which is also thought to be sort of the fight or flight, the original nervous system that if we were being chased by a bear, that would trigger and then we would suddenly, our heart rate would go up, our eyes would dilate and we would run away from the bear. Now the problem in CRPS is there's no bear. We don't need to have that system ramped up. And yet in many patients, that system is ramped up. And that's why they have a lot of these inappropriate sensations. They feel hot, they feel burning, they feel swelling, all of these things. It's because the sympathetic nervous system is ramped up, not in everyone. And again, this is where it's, you know, I'm still fascinated every time I see a patient with CRPS because I'm like looking at this red hot swollen hand going, I don't understand why are you, you know, why is this hand doing this? Um, and in some patients, it may be more autoimmune mechanism you know, related to B cells. In some patients, it might be more the central glial mechanism. And in some patients, it may be more the sympathetic mechanism or all of the above. And so, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about what my lab is specifically interested in, um, but just to say, you know, you can go to the lab website, um, but we're really interested in using uh, models of CRPS to understand better what these cells do. And this is just a picture here of those microglial cells, real microglial cells from, from mice surrounded by these green neurons here. Um, but really interested in what they're doing and maybe how we can target these cells better um, as a, a novel way to treat CRPS and other pain conditions. So I'm going to transition to talking a little bit about um, CRPS diagnosis because I know that was a question that was asked initially. Um, so again, bringing up the Budapest criteria in a slightly different format. Um, you can see here, these are the symptoms, which are things that you would report. You come to the physician and you say, I have touch sensitivity, or I have, you know, a red hand and my other hand is normal colored and this hand's purple. Um, so these are things you would report to your physician. And then the signs are things that the physician would see on exam, or more commonly now, because, you know, we're still a lot of doing a lot of telehealth, we might see through pictures. And, you know, again, with the advent of the iPhone and other um, uh, camera phones, Patients take a lot of pictures of their hands and feet. And so we can see um, a lot of these things because again, it's something I didn't mention, but many patients sort of cycle between hot and cold, for example, even within a day, within a week. 
Um, and so patients will send me pictures of their hand and say like, I know when I saw you in clinic, my hand looked totally normal, but now look at it, you know? And then like two hours later, the hand is like red hot and swollen and, you know, kind of looking purple. And so, you know, it's, it's nice that we can actually see these things now because people can immediately take pictures and send them off to their physicians. So again, um, you know, these are the Budapest criteria. I know somebody had a question about, um, you know, it's hard to actually get the diagnosis of CRPS. I think, you know, every physician is different in how they like make their diagnosis. Um, I think again, because I'm comfortable with CRPS being sort of um, like a, a continuum, let's say, you know, like some patients come with like something in every category. Some patients come with something that, you know, is a little bit less extreme. Um, so I often will give a diagnosis of CRPS as long as I see two or more of these. So not just pain. So pain alone to me does obviously not make a diagnosis of CRPS, but I need to see something else convincing that it falls into this sort of CRPS type of presentation. But I think some, maybe some physicians, because they don't see as much CRPS, they really are very like sticklers to, oh, I need to see something in every category to call it CRPS. So I think it really depends a little bit on the style and the comfort of the, of the physician with the diagnosis and maybe even with the treatment that would come from making this diagnosis. It's also not a diagnosis. I would, you know, just to be clear, it's not something I like want to hand out to people. You know, I want to be sure that somebody meets criteria and is convincingly has CRPS. And so I do also spend a lot of my time in my clinic. Many patients come to me with, do I have CRPS? And I really think about that. And many patients, the answer is no, you don't. Um, actually, you have something else, or I actually don't know what you have, but it's not, I can definitely tell you it's not CRPS. Um, so, you know, sometimes that's also helpful just to, to have that kind of check of, you know, there's a higher probability that somebody has CRPS if they're seeing me, just because that's all I see. But, um, you know, it doesn't mean every patient I see has CRPS. So um, Frank Berkklein, who I'm sure you've all heard about, who's in Germany, has done a lot of work on clinical aspects of CRPS, published this diagnostic approach about six, seven years ago now. Um, and it, I think it's a good guide. Um, I'd say, I, you know, I stick to it in some ways and in others I don't. Um, so, you know, there's this idea of, okay, we suspect CRPS, you know, there's symptoms related to some sort of injury. Um, you know, the injury should have healed by now, uh, mostly in the distal extremity. Um, and, you know, you know, it's not something else. So you're, you're sure that, you know, it's not like an active infection or something, let's say. And then, um, you know, you look at the diagnostic criteria. So again, the ones that I just showed you, the, the um, Budapest criteria, and then you might look at some diagnostic tools. So in his particular algorithm, he says, okay, look at the temperature difference between the two sides. They also use a lot of these three phase bone scans in Europe that I have not used as much here. And I don't know if some of my colleagues do here, but one thing I do a lot of now is these side-by-side x-rays um, because there is evidence that if you compare on x-ray, the CRPS limb to the non-CRPS limb, the CRPS limb will look a little bit, um, uh, the bone will be a little thinned or osteoporotic. Um, and so that is something that I do. Plus it's low exposure to, you know, there's not a lot of radiation exposure. It's something quick you can do, you know, mostly practically at your clinic visit. Um, so these side-by-side x-rays, I definitely do. Um, based on this anal on this um, information, um, Frank Berkline would say, you know, that's the diagnosis of CRPS. If there is no nerve injury, it would be a type one. If there is a nerve injury, it'd be a type two. And then he also sort of puts in this, you know, possibly warm versus cool, um, but also saying like primarily warm, so again, getting to the point that, you know, not all patients are going to always be warm. They might cycle between the two, but they're primarily sort of in a warm phase compared to a primarily cold. So I'm, I'm not sure how much I'll spend on this because I want to leave time for questions, um, but I did want to mention um, this project that we started uh, at Stanford through our multidisciplinary team to really understand better how we can distinguish the cause of peripheral pain. And this was a project that we started several years ago, really trying to understand if we could get a more specific diagnosis for patients who came in with limb pain. So again, not CRPS specific, but people who came in with pain in their hands and feet, arms and legs. So there are ways we can, you know, distinguish peripheral pain or any type of pain. We take a history, obviously, we do a physical exam, 
Um, we might do diagnostic blocks, which are when we look with ultrasound. And if we suspect, let's say the carpal tunnel, we might numb up that nerve with some local anesthetic, um, which would help us diagnose potentially a problem with that nerve by numbing it up. Um, there's EMG or nerve conduction, as I said, which can be useful sometimes, but sometimes not so much. Um, but then there's the potential to use imaging. And we've been lucky enough at Stanford to use some pretty advanced imaging techniques to be able to look more clearly um, at what might be causing this type of peripheral pain. And actually more specifically, if there is a nerve involved in a, type, in a patient's per particular type of pain. So what we did was we started to use something called MR neurography. And MR neurography, and I'll tell you a little bit of details about that. Hang on, um, here. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit of detail. It's like a bit, you know, kind of heavy on the lingo, but just so you get some sense. So MR neurography is sort of developed as an approach to see where the pain might be generated. It is an MRI. So for all intents and purposes, it is a standard MRI, but it's done in a way that's a little bit different um, by the radiology technicians and radi radiation physicists so that you can see better a nerve. Because the, even though you know you think the, the brain and spinal cord on MRI look great, but the brain and spinal cord are pretty big. Even the biggest nerve in your body, the sciatic nerve, which runs down the back of your leg, is only about you know seven millimeters or so. So doing an MRI where you really can see what the sciatic nerve is doing and some of the smaller nerves from the sciatic is really hard. But this technique, um, we have a couple of radiologists here at Stanford who do it really, really well. Um, and we do it, like I said, if you know things look normal and we can't figure out what's going on. So maybe there's trauma, there's a nerve or tumor or things like that. But it really requires expertise because it is a challenging approach. So like I said, the sciatic is the biggest nerve and it's only seven millimeters. So you really do need to do it with a team that knows well how to, to read these exams. So the team we had is basically um, myself as a pain physician, as well as one of my colleagues, Ian Carroll, um, peripheral nerve surgeons who we work with very closely, um, physical therapists and pain psychologists because at Stanford, we're very lucky to run a very multidisciplinary clinic, as well as our radiologists and um, a neurologist who does um, quite a bit of EMG nerve conduction. And so what we did was we took patients, um, and this is a published study that you can look up and it's, it's um, open access, so you should be able to get it for free. Um, but we saw 58 patients over the course of about four years, and we evaluated them all with this MR neurography or the specialized MRI. Most of these patients had lower limb um, CR or lower limb uh, symptoms. I shouldn't not CRPS. They didn't all have CRPS, but lower limb symptoms. And many of these patients complained of the, of having um, the initiating event being surgery, trauma, fracture, et cetera. And some said both, you know, they might've had a fracture and then went to surgery for that. So all of these patients had the specialized MRI, as I mentioned, that was sort of part of what the study was looking at. But many of them also underwent nerve blocks. So that's when we do the ultrasound and we numb up the nerve, um, the electrodiagnostic study, which is the EMG. Um, many of them came already having had a standard MRI. Most of the time, the standard MRI was, ne was negative. The, the um, spinal cord looked great. The brain looked great. Um, and then we had some other research studies ongoing that they may have participated in. So what the most important finding was of this is these are patients who came in who essentially didn't really have diagnoses or their diagnoses were really like general. And then we did the specialized MRI scan. And we found that 60% of patients had a change in the way the nerve looked, um, in the thickness of the nerve, it, the nerve looked deviated, or there was actually um, a, more than one finding. So 38% of patients had more than one finding. And this is just an example here of what that looks like. So this is the elbow here of a patient. This is the ulnar nerve. Um, just for your um, reference, the nerve should look like this one next to it with the green arrow. So the nerve should be very gray, dark gray, almost black. But instead, this is a big, swollen, bright nerve. And here you can see on the side, that's swelling in the surrounding tissue. And so this is a very abnormal nerve on a very abnormal scan, but a standard MRI didn't pick it up. And otherwise, the patient was sort of told they didn't really have anything going on. And then we saw this. So obviously, this is something that maybe we can take more specific action on. So the other thing we looked at with this study was what the referral diagnosis was. So patients coming in with a, a referral of CRPS type one, and then what their diagnosis was after we did this full evaluation. 
And interestingly, in many, many cases, actually about 75% of cases, the diagnosis changed after evaluation. So many patients who had CRPS by type one, three of them still had CRPS type one after evaluation, but six of those patients were actually diagnosed with a specific nerve involved in their CRPS and therefore were shifted to a diagnosis of CRPS type two or one of those patients just to a straight diagnosis of neuropathy of a specific nerve. So again, this concept that, you know, some patients who are thought to have CRPS type one probably have an underlying nerve injury. We just don't do MR neurography on every single patient who comes through the door. This is again, like a complicated specialized process that requires a big team to do it. Um, but I think it also shows that there is value in doing such things. Um, the treatments we provided to these patients, um, in almost all cases, there were medication recommendations, um, multidisciplinary care through physical and occupational therapy and pain psychology. Um, and then some other treatments you can see here that are become a little more directed at the nerve itself. And I'm just gonna talk about surgery for a moment because there was a question about the, if you need surgery, what do you do? And here, um, this is exactly this case, which are these are patients who came in who um, had peripheral, peripheral nerve issues that we detected after doing the specialized MRI and who we are recommending they actually undergo surgery. But many of them had come to us because they had a surgery that they think caused the problem. And now we're telling them, oh, you just need another surgery. Well, of course, that's kind of a hard thing to, to say, right? And I don't feel good about trying to convince a patient to have a surgery when they already feel that they had a surgical related injury. Um, so why did we do that and how did it turn out? So we actually thought, again, when you see a big swollen nerve, like we did on the scan, these nerves are unhappy for lack of a better term. And unless you release the nerve and give it more space, then it's gonna stay unhappy, angry, you know, for the future. So we really did feel like many of these patients had who had these findings, and as I say here, 83% of these patients had positive findings on the MRI. 44% of them had more than one category of abnormality. So they're coming in with very abnormal MRI scans from the specialized MRI. And not only that, but if we went in and with the ultrasound and we numbed up that nerve as a diagnostic procedure, then they had at least temporary relief of their pain. And that was what allowed us to more convincingly discuss this with patients was like, you know, that nerve is definitely part of the problem. When we numb up that nerve, your pain gets better, goes away entirely, or at least gets 50% better or whatever it is. And so with that information, everybody sort of feels more comfortable with the concept of going back to surgery. We don't want to just recommend surgery, you know, sort of willy nilly to anybody coming in the door. We really want to do it thoughtfully after having gone through all of these diagnostics and obviously, you know, share a decision with the patient about whether or not they're, um, you know, willing to do so. But in these cases, we actually did have quite good outcomes. So I just wanted to sort of um, put a slide on this because somebody asked is, you know, so if you have CRPS and you need to have surgery, maybe surgery on your affected limb, but maybe surgery elsewhere, what do you do? And so I really think, you know, first of all, work with your own pain physician um, and the anesthesiology team, because they're really the ones who are gonna be in the operating room while you're having the surgery to develop a plan for managing post-operative pain. Some things that I do for my patients is that I recommend either increasing or restarting antineuropathic medications, for example, gabapentin or nortriptyline or whatever the medication is that you've been on before that, you know, worked for you. Um, I usually recommend starting it the week prior to surgery and continuing it for at least three months or so after. My feeling is for many patients, you know, we just want to get past that sort of three to six month time frame where you know, there's a lot of potential for pain. There's a lot of potential for um, surgical complications, but there's also a lot of potential to trigger CRPS. So kind of keeping at these slightly higher doses for a few months and then weaning down. Um, I'm going to talk about low-dose naltrexone, but I do um, recommend stopping low-dose naltrexone a few days prior to surgery. Um, considering regional anesthesia, again, like a nerve block. So if you're having surgery on your hand, a lot of times they can put like a, a numbing medicine injection into the shoulder area, which would cause numbness of the whole arm. And the nice thing about that is it, it blocks the nerve, the pain signal from going from the hand to the spinal cord into the brain. And we think that blocking that intense nerve signal can actually be very beneficial to block, you know, a flare or worsening of CRPS. 
Um, certainly you can consider other um, options like intraoperative or postoperative ketamine if available. This is something that the anesthesiologist or the pain medicine team would be able to offer in certain hospitals. Um, things that you can do um, would be to take vitamin C, and I didn't sort of talk about the vitamin C part of the study, but vitamin C, 500 a day for 50 days leading up to and after surgery. Um, you know, no real risk here for most patients. So I think it's a reasonable thing to do. And then certainly starting PTOT when clinically able and stable. So again, trying to avoid prolonged immobilization after surgery. So um, in terms of, I'm going to pause here for a second um, on my treatment slide, because um, I just wanted to see, I can't tell if there's any other questions, but um, I did want to just um, talk a little bit about treatment. Um, but I can also pause and see if Alexis wants to ask me questions here. I think we're okay until the end for now. Okay. All right. Then I will keep going. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about different treatment options. Um, as I said before, you know, I really believe that the treatment of CRPS has to be multidisciplinary. And what I mean by that is, you know, medication options, physical therapy, hand therapy, depending on where, what part of the body is affected, um, education about mechanisms, pain psychology, um, and then interventions as appropriate. My feeling is usually that, you know, if each of these things helps 10%, well, then maybe you'll be 40% better. So I really do believe in engaging all of these because I think together they can definitely make a difference even if we can't hit a home run with an individual approach. So the medication options um, for CRPS, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of them and sort of present the, the evidence for them. Um, so in terms of physical therapy, um, interestingly, it's actually very hard to study physical therapy because it's hard to blind people. So you, you can make a randomized controlled trial, but um, you know people usually know if they're having physical therapy. You can't give them like you know fake physical therapy, really. Um, so that when we look at sort of the quality of the evidence, it's not great, but um, there is some good evidence for doing things like graded motor imagery. And so this particular study looked at a combination of limb laterality recognition. So you know, there's um, the app called Recognize that many of you probably are familiar with, where you see pictures of, you know, whatever body part, hands and hands or feet, depending on where you, what affected limb you have. Um, so looking at the laterality, um, imagined movements, and then mirror box therapy. And so the combination of this, um, and there were four trials looking at these, at these interventions, and there was improvement in pain and function um, of 12 weeks of follow-up. So again, this is, it's always for me looking at risk and benefit. Um, the risk of physical therapy is usually minor, although some people do get flares after doing intensive physical therapy. This type of graded motor imagery doesn't usually come with major flares. And some of it, again, is sort of training the brain. So um, it, it is really focused on this sort of cortical restructuring. Um, something I didn't say before, but I'll just mention now, is that some patients with CRPS develop almost what we consider to be a stroke like hemi neglect. And what that means is that after a stroke, patients may not be able to see or move their other side. Like if they have a left-sided stroke, they can't move their right side. Patients with CRPS will sometimes develop. And I think in some ways it's almost like a, um, a really deep-seated like coping strategy. Like if your hand, you injure your right hand and it's completely useless, well, then you just start to live your life with your left hand and you kind of ignore the right hand. But in doing so, we can actually see that there are changes in the brain where the representation of that right hand in the brain is not as strong as it used to be. And so some of this graded motor imagery is actually aimed at sort of reinvigorating um, the right hand in the mind, you know, getting it back included in your life. And sometimes I literally will say that to patients of like, you know, you need to incorporate your right hand back into your activities, back into whatever you're doing, um, because the brain can sort of ignore or forget that limb because it's no longer helpful or useful. Um, in terms of treating sort of the peripheral inflammation, so I talked to you about sort of this autoimmunity or autoinflammation that can happen. Um, steroids can be given. So these are pretty heavy hitter medicines in terms of being um, anti-inflammatory. Um, it's probably that they're most useful in the acute or early phase, um, you know, so within maybe a year after injury, especially when people are still red hot and swollen. Um, again, a study from Berkline showed sort of very high doses um, of prednisolone, which is one steroid, 
um, that he's used. Um, I start a little bit lower based on a different study. Um, I do a three week course of um, prednisone with a taper. And so again, you know, you have to consult your physician, see if this is appropriate for you. But I have had some patients do well, especially if they're in that really red hot swollen phase. Um, bisphosphonates are another important group and many people talk about um, the, the neuridronate study from Italy. Um, unfortunately, the neuridronate study done in the US did not show any evidence, but some of the other um, drugs in that family, bisphosphonates, which are um, basically targeting bone turnover, have been shown to be effective. Um, and again, they're most likely to be helpful if you have, remember I talked about those side-to-side x-rays. So the side-to-side x-rays, if it shows that your injured side has low bone density, then bisphosphonates may actually be helpful. And this is just data from looking at four different trials using four different um, bisphosphonate type drugs and showing that there was an effect of favoring effect of those bisphosphonates, meaning they were helpful in the treatment of CRPS. And the only one that's really kind of widely available in the US is this um, oral alendronate or Fosamax is the other name for it. Um, and so this is the, what I've done based on this study is um, now it's only available here in 35 milligram tablets, but we do 35 daily for the eight weeks. Um, ketamine is something that's obviously very hot right now, apparently for the treatment of depression, um, but has been used for the treatment of CRPS for many years now based on two studies um, that were, came out about 10 years ago now. Um, we at Stanford do both of these protocols, again, based on the data from these studies where we do um, an outpatient protocol, it's usually four hours of infusion over 10 days, um, or an inpatient protocol where it's sort of a continuous infusion. Um, the mean in these studies was um, 22 milligrams an hour. Um, here we sort of start very low and sort of titrate to effect. Um, but again, when we look at these two studies combined, the effects favor ketamine um, for the treatment of CRPS. And again, you know, these are general studies and whether or they not they apply to individuals, we don't know. Um, but my experience with ketamine on the inpatient side um, has been that about a third of patients have absolutely no improvement, nothing. We turn it on, we turn it up, no improvement at all. About a third of patients have improvement during the infusion. But as soon as we turn off the infusion, unfortunately, their pain and their symptoms come right back. And then we have about a third of patients who have lasting improvement, meaning, you know, they do great. They maybe come back every few months for another treatment, maybe twice a year. Um, but by and large, they actually are able to get functional benefit from a ketamine infusion. Um, and one thing I've also, and this is totally anecdotal, we are actually, we have a study on going to look at ketamine outcomes, but this is just my own anecdotal um, thoughts is that patients who get relief at lower doses tend to do better long-term. So for many patients, if we have to push, push, push the doses, um, you know, then we don't necessarily get long-term relief. And again, this is generalizing, some patients do, but um, we often see responses at these lower infusion rates for many patients. I know somebody was asking about low-dose naltrexone. So low-dose naltrexone is interesting because we think it might actually act on microglia, which are these cells that I'm particularly interested in in my lab. Um, and microglia express a receptor called TLR4 that we think activates these cells and makes them kind of spew out inflammation. And if you take LDN or lotus naltrexone, we think that they actually will decrease the ability of the microglial cells to spew out that inflammation. Now, interestingly, the drug itself, naltrexone, um, is used for alcohol dependence and opioid addiction, but that's at a dose of 50 milligrams. Um, the low dose, what we really call LDN, is 4.5 milligrams. Um, and it needs to be compounded because they need to sort of crush up that 50 milligram tablet and then make it into a 4.5 milligram tab. Um, the Stanford, the dose we use here at Stanford is 4.5 milligrams at night, two hours prior to bedtime. Sometimes I start lower. Um, I maybe we'll start with a milligram at night and then increase it slowly. Some patients I have will just park themselves at a milligram and it's good and they're fine. And then in very few cases over time, I have gotten higher up to nine milligrams or doubling the dose um, all at once at night. Um, but I don't usually go higher than that. And the reason is that naltrexone itself is actually a blocker of the opioid receptor of the morphine receptor. And if you block the morphine receptor, you can block opioid addiction. Um, so it kind of makes sense, um, but that's that high dose. So I want to use low dose naltrexone at a low dose because I don't want to block the effect of the morphine receptor. I want to just block it, the effect of 
um, this inflammation cell, this inflammatory cell, the microglia. And so that's, but that is another reason why I mentioned, I usually recommend patients stop LDN prior to surgery because theoretically at the low dose, it could block morphine action. And if you're having surgery, you might need to get oxycodone or morphine or fentanyl or something like that. So even though it's theoretical, I just for safety, ask patients to usually stop naltrexone before surgery. Also some some physicians might not be familiar with it. And if they see it on your medication list, they might, you know, get worried that there's going to be, you know, it's going to cause some interactions. So again, I always feel like it's safer to just stop it in advance by a few days. Um, the dosing of the lotus naltrexone was actually based on this study by um, Jared Younger and Sean Mackey here at Stanford about 10 years ago. They were actually looking at fibromyalgia. Um, and what they saw was that patients at baseline had a, a certain symptom severity of fibromyalgia. They did, um, they gave them just a sugar pill or, um, you know, placebo, and then they gave them the drug and then they let the drug wash out and they kind of followed the se severity of their symptoms over time. Um, interestingly, there wasn't a whole lot of effect, but if they split the groups by um, the dark black line here being those who had um, fatigue, so these are patients who had a lot of daytime fatigue, they did better. Their severity of symptoms really came down and stayed down compared to the dotted line with patients who did not have fatigue. So this is actually sort of how we use low dose naltrexone. We use the same dose they used in this study. And again, patients who have a fatigue component are ones we think are more likely to have um, benefit. So um, we do do some sympathetic blocks, although the data for them is not particularly good. Um, there was a recent study that um, came out that said that the overall quality for sympathetic blocks is very low. Um, and it's unclear how helpful they are. But again, you know, sometimes when patients have such severe CRPS that we're sort of grasping at straws, it's something that can be done safely, you know, if it's with a trained physician. So I do think sometimes they can have benefit and sometimes we'll do them, you know, three sympathetic blocks, um, three weeks apart to try to see if um, that provides more benefit. And then also, and this is very hard to do right now because of insurance authorizations, but um, another study from my colleagues here 10 years ago showed that if you gave a local anesthetic bupivacaine or you gave a local anesthetic bupivacaine plus Botox, like the same Botox you do for, you know, for beauty, for aesthetics, um, but if you injected that into a lumbar sympathetic block, then you actually see that the days of analgesia or basically the pain-free days is much longer, about 250 days with this combination compared to the local anesthetic only. It's very hard to get approval for um, Botox from insurance. So it's something, unfortunately, we don't do very often. Um, so I'm not really gonna touch on neuromodulation too much because it's not really my area, but I just wanted to finish up my last slide um, talking about hydroxychloroquine because it's a medicine that um, we were interested to study um, and that we recently published a case series on um, and because it's something I don't think a lot of people have heard of for CRPS. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's probably some autoimmune mechanisms underlying CRPS. Um, so these B cells can sort of cause the attack of different um, receptors or proteins in the body. Um, and that's been found in some patients with CRPS, they have what we call autoantibodies against their own receptors. Um, and you can actually take those antibodies or those little proteins that these cells make, and you can transfer symptoms from a patient with CRPS to a mouse. And so it does seem like there is this kind of autoimmune phenotype or, or this autoimmune cause of some patients' CRPS. And there's some evidence to support the use, again, of the steroids, a big squash on the immune system, um, and other immune modulators. So with one of my colleagues here, we started to use hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, um, which is also used in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And so we treated patients off-label. Obviously, this is a medicine that's not you know, approved for CRPS, although as you probably know, most med medications are not approved for CRPS. Um, and we treated a group of seven women um, who had um, CRPS for many, many years, in some cases up to 25 years. So these are really chronic refractory. They've tried many, many different treatments. Um, and they were treated with hydroxychloroquine for varying amounts of time. Um, one of them stopped it, the one who just did one month, but most of them continued on for several years. And many of these patients are still on hydroxychloroquine. And what we found was that their numerical rating scale, so going back to the beginning, I told you like that scale from one to 10 is sort of meaningless, but it's what we have in some cases. And so what we did see is that the average 
um, you know, number uh, and the, the, the flare number was decreased in the patients after they took hydroxychloroquine. And then this is just an image from one of our patients who, that's published in this paper here, um, where pre-treatment, you can see this patient had modeling of the foot, kind of swollen sort of doughy appearance. And after treatment um, had much more um, definition of the foot and actually was able to walk and, and do quite a bit more after treatment. Some of these patients also stopped the medication for a time, their symptoms got worse, and then they started it again, making us also feel like it was probably doing something um, useful. So I'm gonna stop there and just say, I mean, many of you know this, but CRPS occurs in the distal extremities after an injury. It looks like usual healing, but that trajectory seems off, it lasts longer, it doesn't get better um, as we expect it should. And that really there are different options for treatment, but multidisciplinary treatment is really key. And then I just wanna thank all of the, the members of our NERV team, who's the multidisciplinary group um, that, we, um, that we care for patients with, as well as the funding for my, um, my research lab from NIH and some foundation funding as well. And so with that, I'm happy to take questions and um, I can stop my share in a second here. Awesome, oh my gosh, that was so informative. <laughs> Before we dive in, Jim, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Yes, Dr. Tarfik, two quick questions. Do you have any, uh, we get a lot of questions about dental surgery. Do you, do you have any brief recommendations for some perioptive things? That yeah. yeah, I get asked about dental surgery a lot too. So, so one thing I didn't say, but like surgery on the CRPS limb is the most likely to cause a CRPS flare. So I worry less about something like dental surgery, which is like far from, you know, assuming, you know, classic CRPS hands and feet. Um, so I worry less about it, but I still worry um, because I just worry all the time. Um, but so with my patients who have CRPS, I usually tell them, you know, if you're on it, same thing as I said in that surgery slide, if you're on antineuropathics, increase them, um, make sure the dentist numbs you up, make sure, you know, you are numb before they start the surgery um, and then just kind of keep an eye on it. But mo again, like, you know, I hate to generalize, but most of my patients do well with those kinds of things and don't need more than that. Um, but I would just say like, control of the acute pain is probably the most important thing. So whatever, every, every patient's different and what they'll actually need to control that, but you don't want to be walking around after dental surgery with 10 out of 10 pain for like, you know, a week and not tell anyone. You want to make sure that that acute pain is treated because that on its own can trigger worsening pain everywhere. The other quick question is about graded motor imaging. Is, is that good anytime during the course of the illness? Yeah, so I think like most of, a lot of these have been studied early on. Um, so, you know, probably okay anytime. It, again, this goes to like risk benefit, like the risk of it is so low that I would say, you know, anytime during the illness, especially if there's a functional component, like if you can't move your arm still, then yes, you should do graded motor imaging. If you're already using your hand totally normally and it functions normally, then yeah, I mean, it might help a little, but I'd say especially for a functional component because that imagined movements is sometimes all somebody's going to be able to do. And so if you take somebody who hasn't moved their hand in a year and you're like, okay, now we're going to do handstands, like obviously they're not going to do it. So you have to start slow. And so that the, the motor imagery part of it is really important. Thank you. Awesome. So yeah, definitely going to try to get through these as quickly as possible. So obviously you work with uh, CRPS patients and some people were asking like, do you work with patients who maybe have CRPS and something else, or maybe just something like arachnoiditis? If so, can you name some of those other conditions for us? Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, so I, 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 it's hard to find people who just have one thing. Right. Um, but yeah, my, I mean, my area of expertise is CRPS. I obviously can see any type of patient with any type of pain, but this is, I think, where my expertise lies. But I think the question is more about like, what are the co-occurring conditions? And it's a really good question. So one thing I see a lot, is um, Ehlers-Danlos type um, type three uh, benign? Where they they used to call it benign hypermobility, um, but you know we all know it's not quite benign. Um, but benign joint hypermobility, I see a lot more in patients with CRPS. Um, arachnoiditis, yes. Um, arachnoiditis is tricky because on its own, it's such a um, it's such a severe condition that it's hard to know. Is it 
is everything represented by arachnoiditis or is CRPS, so is CRPS really a separate diagnosis or is it really just all arachnoiditis? Um, but yes, I do have patients who, who sort of, who present with both. Um, you know, some patients also have, I'd say like um, other neuropathic conditions or multiple nerves involved. So they have like maybe just kind of nerves that are more reactive. So they might have like, you know, we do a block in their leg and we see that like one nerve is affected, but then it turns out three of the nerves are affected. So there is something definitely like connective tissue, like about patients with CRPS, it's, again, some patients with CRPS. Right. What comments or thoughts can you make uh, about CRPS or people who have CRPS in more central parts of the body? So maybe it's not in their limbs. Yeah. So this, I would say it's very controversial, like the European um, research groups and CRPS, like essentially don't think it's CRPS if it's central, you know, they really think it's like arms and legs. They even think like me, CRPS isn't CRPS. Um, you know, to me, it's like, I'm not, I'm not such, I guess I'm not such like a stickler for the rules. Like if it sort of has, you know, these, if it meets the criteria and mostly if I think that the treatments might be beneficial, because in the end, the diagnosis is just, is just the diagnosis, right? But it's like, can we convincingly make an argument for some of these really off, off label drugs? So if somebody comes in and, you know, they have like a red hot swollen, um, you know, like flank, like their, their side of their, of their abdomen is red hot and swollen. And it's like, well, it's not really CRPS because it's not in the hand and foot, but it's like, you know, it kind of has this autoimmune flavor to it. Like nothing else has worked for you. Like let's try hydroxychloroquine. Like, you know, these are the risks, these are the potential benefits. So I think it just really depends, but yeah, I mean, I would say like classic CRPS, like the, the Europeans are going to tell you it's not CRPS is not in the body. For me, it matters less. It's more about what treatment um, options are appropriate. Awesome. And I know you definitely have a hard stop. I have a couple more questions. I'm going to try to like rush through really quickly. I have eight minutes. Yes. We're going to get through these. So, um, can you talk about maybe some other, um, I guess maybe alternative things that you've seen that have worked? So a lot of someone was asking, you know, do you believe in like mind body work to calm the nervous system? Have you seen people have a lot of success with like CBD, um, you know, can cannabinoids? I can never pronounce yeah, that word. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, I mean, the mind body, I, I didn't talk much about pain psychology, but like a thousand percent like our pain psychologists here are awesome. They're like at the forefront of like what to do for, for pain psychology. Um, so absolutely. And I always include them in my care plans and um, in my dreams, I'm going to have time to make like an outpatient CRPS program at Stanford, where we would like really integrate like physical therapy, pain psychology, and medical treatment um, in a like beautifully packaged outpatient program. If you could just add some hours to my day. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And there are some, you know, there's like acceptance and commitment therapy, and then like kind of the more classic um, cognitive behavioral therapy that I think is, is really important. But yes, mind, mindfulness-based stress reduction, you know, again, these are things like everybody's different in what works for them, but absolutely, I'm a huge proponent of all of those. In terms of like, the more alternative medications or like medicinal, you know, what's out there. Um, I think somebody asked about psilocybin on the prior chat, um, which is the magic mushrooms. I mean, there is no data right now for the use of, of psilocybin for the treatment of pain. It is a totally like empty space. We're actually trying to do some collaborative work um, in, our, in our basic science mouse models, looking at the question of whether psilocybin might have be benefits in chronic pain. Um, so I don't know yet, but, um, at least, you know, the, all the evidence that's out there is really just anecdotal. Um, cannabinoids are, I would say a little bit ahead of that in that there is very clearly a cannabinoid system in the brain, in the body. These immune cells that I talked about express cannabinoid receptors. Um, the neurons express cannabinoid receptors. We know that cannabinoids can modulate pain. That's much more clear. The tricky thing is what's commercially or I guess commercially and non-commercially available um, for cannabinoids right now, don't, they're kind of, they're dirty drugs in that they just kind of like activate everything. And so there are a lot of side effects and it's unclear if for all patients, like the side effects are worth the benefit. Um, I'm hoping we are working. We also have like a cannabinoid project we're working on in the lab where we're trying to develop in collaboration with some very smart people here at Stanford, some more specific 
targeted drugs that would, um, you know, enhance the ability to activate some of these receptors. Um, so anyway, there's a lot more to come, but I think, you know, I always worry, I always think about like risk benefit and some of these things, you know, like, you know, I was going to say fly to Florida and get a $20,000 infusion, but Alexis is in Florida. So maybe I shouldn't say that, but like, okay. you know, this, this idea of like, you know, we're going to give you vitamins and it's going to cure you. Well, if the price tag is like $20,000, like I'm, a, I'm like, mm. so, you know, there's risks like to your body, but there's also risks to your wallet. And um, sometimes I worry that patients really get taken advantage of because they're really looking for something that could help. Right. And our last question is we know you have to go. So if everyone cannot get to Stanford to, you know, work with you and your team. Do you have any recommendations? And, you know, we can reach out to you to get those. Do you have any recommendations on, you know, other physicians across the country, or maybe some who know a lot about the peripheral nerve or just some of the work that you're doing as well? Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just generally say like, look for nerds. Um, and what, I, what I mean by that is like, look for a physician who's like intellectually curious and like willing to sort of like try things with you because in the end, like, it's, I don't think, I mean, I do think about CRPS a lot, but I, I don't think that it's necessarily that I'm like, so I'm, I'm so much better at treating CRPS. It's just that I'm, I care and I'm curious and I want to help my patients. And so I think you can find that anywhere. You don't need to come to Stanford. Um, but you, you do need to find that in, in the person. And, you know, and so I have a lot of physicians who reach out to me from across the country to get, um, you know, input, but a lot of the stuff we've done is out there and published. And so, you know, you want a physician who, if you bring a paper to them and say like, Hey, this seems crazy, but like, what do you think if we try this? you know, let's talk about the risks and potential benefits for me. And the physician is excited and interested, not, and doesn't see that as like, you know, you're, why are you trying to tell me what to do sort of thing, but sees it as like, you know, oh yeah, you're right. I don't know what to do. So let's try this. Then I think that's the most important thing. So I think find your local nerds. Um, most of them are at academic centers, but not always. You can find nerds anywhere. So awesome. I just want to count on you to develop that center of excellence for CRPS at Stanford. We talked about that. I know, I know. I just, there's so many things, there's so many things, but yes, I, I really do wanna do that. I just have to, I need, I need, uh, I need to duplicate myself or something. Right. I, need to, <laughs> I need a clone. Well, thank you so much for all of this information. This has, I'm not just saying that this has been one of my favorite Facebook laugh so far, Jim, don't get me in trouble for saying that, but it is. <laughs> so so as, as always, everyone watching this video is going to be pinned to the top of our Facebook timeline for easy access. If you want to rewatch it, send it to everyone you know. And of course, we're going to add it to YouTube as well. And of course, we do have the link to the presentation. So remember that if you have any questions for us, if you need a support group, if you need a new physician in your state, or if you want to tell your story on our blog, please email us at info at rsds.org and we'll get back to you. Thank you. Have a great evening, y'all. Thank you.